welcome back. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Welcome back, folks. I will take a step back. Uh, if you make your way in, we will make a start because uh, we are, as with other sessions, on a, a relatively tight uh, timetable to get through the contributions of the fantastic panel uh, that lies ahead. Um, so our focus in this session is now uh, turning to uh, decision making. Uh, we are uh, focusing primarily on how research funders and publishers um, are uh, rethinking processes of uh, review, allocation of funding uh, and evaluation, uh, both of projects and of people. And of course, we've touched on some of this already uh, in the last session. Um, but we're particularly interesting as well in hearing from uh, our panelists uh, about their experiences of experimenting with uh, research on research uh, techniques and methods uh, and the lessons that they can offer us as we uh, develop an agenda uh, for the months uh, and years ahead. Um, as before, I'm not going to do lengthy introductions because we don't have time, but just to run quickly through uh, the lineup, we're going to hear first. Uh, from Wilhelm Krull, uh, known, I'm sure, to many of you, the Secretary General of the uh, Volkswagen Foundation. Uh, and indeed, we're lucky to have uh, Wilhelm here because he is only in that role now, I think, till the end of the year uh, when he steps down and off into another role, which he can tell us about. Uh, we're then going to hear from uh, Richard uh, Nakamura, uh, the former director uh, and now advisor to the uh, NIH, Center for Science Review at the NIH in the, in the US. And, NIH, I think, stands out as one of the funders worldwide that has invested uh, most substantially and over uh, the longest period in these kinds of um, uh, activities and, and, and techniques. So Richard is going to give us an insight uh, into uh, one or two examples uh, that will be instructive. Um, turning then to the world of publishers, uh, we are really pleased to have Magdalena Skipper here, uh, Editor-in-Chief, of course, of Nature. And uh, finally, from the publisher side, we'll have Peter Rogers, Features Editor uh, of eLife. Uh, our discussant will be Bev Holmes, uh, who we've heard ask a couple of questions earlier in the day, uh, President and CEO of the Michael Smith Foundation uh, for Health Research in Canada. Um, I won't do introductions, we'll just sort of whiz through. Uh, the lights will do their thing. And uh, hopefully, if we all stick to time, we'll have uh, opportunity for questions uh, and discussion at the end. Wilhelm. Well, thank you very much, James, for the introduction and also to you, Trinetia, for inviting us all along. I think this was a wonderful day so far, so perhaps I can only spoil it by talking about practices of research funding. Um, I couldn't agree more with some of the statements you made at the beginning, particularly with respect to that evidence tends to be narrow, fragmented, and rarely generalizable. I think in many cases we do have uh, studies, also the Volkswagen Foundation committed several of them, but it's not the kind of thing that would actually allow to compare in a, on a wider scale what is going on and how we can develop things. Um, I strongly believe in learning by comparing, and I think that's probably a good principle to start with. And also, um, with 35 years of experience in research policy making and research funding, I hope that I can contribute a few things to the furthering of this. Of course, as far as peer review is concerned, there are quite some studies around. Uh, I'm sure most of you are um, familiar with the study by Michel Amon on uh, how professors think, focusing entirely on on peer review panels and how panels work. And uh, she clearly brings out that the intellectual habitus of those individuals that, that they bring to the table um, implicitly also lead to biases in this kind of uh, uh, environment. And uh, of course, when you look at the problems and conflicting interests in uh, peer review processes, you will at least have three players. One is, of course, the expectations of the applicants themselves. Then, of course, the peer review system as it operates. And of course, always the funding institution, its objectives, its philosophy behind it. Some call this even a Bermuda Triangle, but uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we can come out of that also with some good uh, implement, um, uh, knowledge. Um, 
Of course, there is also the study or let's say the recommendations by the Royal Society on cognitive bias. And um, I think these action points are ones we should all pay attention to, um, particularly the ones at the bottom. Remember, you are unlikely to be more fair and less prejudiced than the average person. For Germany, at least, you probably have seen some of the statistics that everybody thinks he's driving much better than the average driver. <laughs> so 90% in Germany at least believe in that, and uh, you may have your own conclusions about that. Well, then, of course, the group and social dynamics in peer review processes play a huge role. Um, the German uh, metaphor is, uh, of course, as you can see here, uh, the Platzhirsch effect, as it's called. Um, I think for the United Kingdom, it's probably more the top dog effect. When I was an observer on behalf of the Science Policy Advisory Council, ever so often when only one or two foreigners were involved in the peer review panel process, uh, for instance, at Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, these foreigners always looked at the top researcher from Germany, and when he was saying this is a good thing, they finally agreed, despite the fact that at breakfast they told me they were not convinced that this was a kind of um, top-notch research. The other thing is, of course, and that's concerning us as a private funder, um, this latent risk aversion. Like right here, your proposal is innovative. Unfortunately, we won't be able to use it because it has never, we have never tried something like this before. Uh, there's even a, a more telling story by somebody on a, a decision-making panel saying, well, I'm always in favor of new ideas, but this one I've never heard of. <laughs> so the other thing is, of course, and it was already touched upon this morning, risk and failure. Uh, and the failure issue, I think, is something which we, at least in the Central European systems, are very much afraid of. And uh, if we are afraid of that, then of course you see we will miss out on those things beyond the mainstream kind of activities. And I think it's crucial that we pay attention to this kind of opportunity that learning from failure, or you could say failing forward, is something that we all have to pay attention to. Then, of course, there is this uh, notion of predictive validity of past performance in peer review. Um, I'm not quite sure that it applies what is said here. Past performance is no guarantee for future results. But on the other hand, increasingly, and I'm sure you will come across that, have come across that as well, more and more people just look at past performance and do not really spend much time appreciating the originality of the research idea. And ever so often, also in panel meetings, people quickly tend to check whether the age factor is that high or that low, and then uh, that impacts quite considerably on these. Another topic that was already touched upon is, of course, you see the inclusion of female researchers. In many review panels these days, there are quota, and the same one and the same women are asked all over again, and it's very, very burdensome for some of them to be asked and to, of course, uh, often also have to turn down uh, these kind of requests, which, of course, leads us then to recruiting people who are not maybe at the same level. The most challenging thing is, of course, to define the right criteria and assessment methods. As you can see here, it depends totally on what is your key indicator. Is it the workload carried, or is it the elegance of uh, riding, or what is it? And um, for us, um, it is, of course, crucial to really try to think about uh, how to select highly original and innovative projects. Uh, and. Um, one of those examples we are currently experimenting with in the literal sense of the word, because the whole thing is also called experiment, is to just ask for three pages of a project outline, plus, of course, a CV and a publication list, and to add to it one page of self-assessment. And the self-assessment questions in this case are quite crucial because they more or less force the applicant to also look at his or her own proposal from an external point of view, particularly with respect to the third question, which objections do you expect? How would you argue against your own idea? Is there anything that may change your perspective when you are asked uh, something like that? 
Then we also introduced um, a so-called funding joker or wildcard, you may say. The wildcard is crucial because it somehow takes away this consensus mechanism or the force to come up with a consensus on these kind of things because you can once during the meeting throw this white card on the table and say I believe in this original idea I want to get it funded and then we will also fund it. Of course the other members of the panel fairly often then say I want to see this in particular at the next status symposium because of course the skepticism prevails but it has shown to be quite an interesting feature for this kind of high risk uh, funding. There's another element we just added and that is randomization. That is quality controlled randomization, so it's not that we throw all the applications into one pot, but the review panel first of all selects those, let's say about 100 from some seven, six to 700 uh, pre-proposals, and then um, of course once they have omitted those whom they consider not to be eligible at all, then all of these are put back into a pot and the same number of proposals is then selected randomly. And randomization, I think, at least that's our experience after two rounds of doing this, and we will have to wait for another two or three rounds and then also for the results of this. It clearly already shows us that it attributes or it, it adds diversity to the whole thing, and it helps us, of course, to also overcome some of the biases against female researchers. At least that's for the time being one of the intermediate outcomes, and it will be interesting to see how it evolves over time. But at least it allows for, let's say, uh, also some similarly ranked uh, applications to get funded uh, through this kind of process. A very different approach uh, is the one we take for the so-called Freigeist Fellowships. These are fellowships equivalent to the ERC junior grants, so people can get up to 2 million euros for uh, six to eight years and uh, can then pursue their own research. For this, we realize that it's essential to build a kind of Freigeist Collegium, you may call it, or a college, where we have then, let's say, a certain number of people who are also, or who have demonstrated in their own way of uh, doing research that they are open-minded also to unusual or off-the-beaten-track kind of activities. And um, one of the motivations is, of course, also that uh, the uh, individual assessments these days, when you talk to colleagues from other research councils or research organizations, you often have to ask five or six in order to get one response, unless you see to it that you create a higher commitment of those people who are uh, actually supporting you. And for Freigeist, we have also introduced something new. I don't know whether you can see it down here. How confident do you feel about your assessment of this application? So that people can actually also on a scale say, I'm quite confident or I'm not really an expert in the field. And fairly often those that are not experts are more enthusiastic about the proposal than those who are close to the area. Well, uh, in more and more programs, we have introduced two-step selection processes. Uh, that is, of course, due to the expansion of project-based funding in almost every European country. Um, for instance, uh, in Germany, many, many universities these days have even exceeded the 60 to 40 relation, which was once um, proposed in a study by the Swedish Academy of uh, Sciences. Um, it was Gunnar Öquist and Mats Benner, and I think Mats Benner is even in the room somewhere. Um, and uh, they actually looked at various countries, and when you have this huge shift, as we've seen it more recently in many countries from uh, core funding to project-based funding, you also lose out, of course, on your strategic ability to actually set your own priorities. As far as the peer review process is concerned, we more and more come across uh, the, let's say, the need to explain what are our main criteria for what kind of activity. This is just one example where you can see that the person-related kind of uh, approaches uh, ask for much more originality and high-risk, high-gain kind of uh, research. The project-based kind of or thematic agenda, of course, then requires a much more alignment with the respective call. 
Uh, for us, of course, it is essential that we also rethink the mode of allocation and that we also try to encourage people to really come up with high risk, high gain kind of ideas. And um, I always call this, we would like to establish or help to establish a high trust culture of creativity because if we encourage people to set ambitious goals, we also have to be prepared to share the risks with them. And uh, when we embark upon defining a new program or a funding initiative, as we like to call it, the international cooperations and the readiness to take risks are uh, really upfront when we discuss uh, innovation and innovative processes. As far as the criteria are concerned, um, it's usually important that it's an anti-cyclical and complementary approach to public funding because, you see, despite the fact that we are by far the largest private research funder in Germany, we are still small. So this year we can probably spend 250 million euros. Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft ten, uh, spends more than 10 times the amount. So for us, it's really crucial to see to it that we are, let's say, ahead of the wave, you may say, that we identify those things that are really, let's say, offering new opportunities for us to really make a difference and to see to it that the research community is gradually established and that for junior researchers there are career prospects that can go with this new kind of uh, initiative or program. And of course, the overall issue is also how does it fit into the, uh, let's say, uh, the overarching kind of objectives of the foundation itself. What is also crucial, and this is my third point, is of course that we have to rethink and reconfigure evaluation. You can see lots and lots of evaluations. I myself have been involved in quite a lot of them across Europe, but it's really necessary to think about what is needed at what stage, or is it just a kind of issue of legitimacy? Fairly often, you see, you are even asked to legitimize a certain policy decision that has been made elsewhere, and I think that's really more or less a waste of time if you have to focus on that. But on the other hand, of course, I think for us, it's really also an opportunity to learn from external experts uh, because you see within the network around a foundation or a funding organization, you always get many, many compliments. People tell you how wonderful you're doing and if you believe in it, you may be on the wrong track with respect to the overarching issues you're pursuing. I myself strongly believe in this kind of, uh, let's say, bottom-up approach. So you have the project funded kind of area where you do the peer review, then you have the evaluation of funding initiatives or programs. Above that, you look at the funding and management areas, in this case of the Volkswagen Foundation, and then every eight to 10 years, you have an evaluation overarching and looking at how the institution has developed over time. For us, to sum up, it's essential that we try to establish a culture of creativity uh, maybe like on this picture where you see uh, a painter uh, painting a bird whilst looking at the egg out of which the bird may emerge. And I think with that, I leave you and thank you for your attention. Well, um, thank you for that uh, fantastic overview uh, and bang on time as well. Uh, so double thanks. We're going to hear now from uh, Richard. So one of the things I have to make clear, um, NIH no longer sees me as an advisor or a special advisor or otherwise. I, I'm strictly a volunteer um, working on some projects that I began um, while I was director of the Center for Scientific Review. So um, my title is retired. <coughs> Just for a little bit of background information, the Center of uh, Scientific Review at NIH um, is the gateway for all grant applications to NIH. Um, we reviewed about, under my uh, purview, 75% of NIH grant applications. Uh, it has 500 employees. There, it has a very large budget. Um, and um, NIH spends over $30 billion per year on research, um, 25 billion of which is on um, research evaluated through peer review. So this is a very economically important um, act activity for NIH. 
And NIH, of course, wants to make sure we get it right. So if the goal is to have grant funding resources maximally advance knowledge of living systems and increase ability to understand and treat disorders, then finding the most productive and efficient methods uh, to allocate resources to achieve that goal is important. Uh, in some ways, I like the um, goal outlined within at the beginning of this session uh, that uh, uh, the Wellcome Trust has, has set up. So um, we set out to devote some of our resources to uh, conducting uh, research on review. And we've developed multiple approaches uh, to that. Uh, we, uh, we really dislike uh, bibliometric measures. Uh, so I tried to avoid that to the extent possible. But um, some people at NIH prefer that we at least compare our performance against bibliometric measures as well. Um, so we use experts for quality measurement. We used uh, quick feedback surveys to get feedback from our scientists, particularly on our review committees, but also uh, from the uh, field. Uh, we fe felt that if we could develop surveys that only took uh, three to five minutes of an investigator's time, they were much more willing to respond than when you do a longer survey. Uh, we tended to get a 60% response rate. Um, we studied the efficiency of review. We studied ranking and scoring to try and see which systems uh, developed the, the most um, uh, differentiation among applications. Um, we assessed fairness and reliability in peer review. We looked at possibility of review alternatives. There's change going on within review itself. And uh, we wanted to minimize the burden, burden of the review process. So I'm going to give an example of a study that we have done. It's not finished. Uh, the results are under embargo, so I will hint at the results. <laughs> so um, in general, review is pretty fair, that um, we compensate for stage of career by budgeting number of applications to uh, people at different um, stages of career. It's pretty fair on gender. At least we have equal success rates for women and men. Um, you can uh, see some fine detail uh, problems within that, but it's not bad. We control success rates across fields of science. Um, I'll get to race and ethnicity. Um, and um, we uh, reviewers uh, feel that they do a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there were concerns about the possibility of reviewer bias, which especially came out uh, when the Ginther uh, et al. study came out um, in 2011, which was just uh, as I took over at the Center for Scientific Review. What that uh, revealed was it looked at um, success rates across underrepresented uh, or well-represented um, minority populations compared to white scientists. And uh, these were the general uh, results. So um, groups other than whites had slightly lower success rates. Uh, Latino scientists were just off of uh, other white scientists. Uh, Asians um, were at about 90% of the overall success rate of white scientists. Uh, the, the study said that there was a, um, about, I think, a 12 or 13% difference in success rates of African-American and white scientists. What that translated to in success rate was that African-Americans received awards at 55% of the rate of whites, almost half. Um, when that uh, data came out, it was immediately seen that this was a major problem for NIH because it suggested, um, as in many other aspects of American society, African Americans were being discriminated against inappropriately. So one of the key things I was asked to do was to look at different ways we could evaluate this and see if we can determine uh, the reasons uh, for this. We have done a number of different studies. Uh, to try and uh, analyze them uh, right now. Uh, major one is trapped in review. Uh, this one has not been written yet, so I can only hint at the results. So this is an anonymizing study, um, and uh, there, this was a, um, a hunt for bias. So the principle behind the study was if we took 
um, a set of applications from white and African American and other scientists. So uh, we were looking for the possibility of bias based on uh, race, uh, based on gender, based on institutional reputation, um, and um, um, career stage. So, but the primary examination was for um, race. And um, because we knew we had a, a major problem there, and uh, we were looking at um, uh, the following. So if racial disparities in grant funding exist, African American award rates much lower than whites, um, other biases were, ex were expected, and this is gender, uh, stage of career, et cetera. Um, the average preliminary overall impact scores account for variance and final scores. Uh, we, there is data which we have not yet published but are planning to publish uh, that shows that, that account for the full award disparity. So uh, the decision to make an award does not affect the proportion of um, African Americans versus whites. Uh, that is completely determined by the uh, preliminary impact scores. The major hypotheses for the disparity were reviewer bias or a difference in the quality of application submission. And if there is bias, anonymizing applications should reduce disparities. So um, uh, there's no slides after this, so I'll say generally, um, we thought that this was very well powered for uh, determining um, if there were bias in the system, and that is a relatively modest proportion difference in scoring um, change uh, would be uh, seen as significant. What we uh, instead learned was that though the original um, scoring of all scientists has a um, intra um, um, intergroup correlation of X, which is low, um, we had enough um, people in the study to assure that we could see um, a, a one-third difference um, ch change uh, based on the numbers. Unfortunately, we found that the noise level um, um, increased so that the noise doubled um, and the um, portion of variance accounted for uh, by our scoring system was a quarter of the original um, studies. So therefore, um, the end result was that we could not find a significant difference even though the disparity between black and white uh, scores was cut in half. So by anonymization. So um, this is um, uh, this has led to a, a severe internal debates about how to phrase uh, what went on because uh, this was quite an expensive study. It involved uh, 7,200 reviews. Um, redoing an original set of, of reviews. What I've relearned is that behavioral studies are hard. <laughs> <clears throat> and that particularly when you are, are starting with a fairly noisy system as we have in peer review, um, it makes it much harder and uh, harder to get results. And that having systems where it's possible to um, um, integrate information across large groups is a good idea. Okay, I see that I'm out of time, and I'll leave it at that point. I'll make other comments later. Thank you. Richard, thank you. Really fascinating uh, case study. Um, and hopefully we'll have time to come back to you, I'm sure, with questions. Um, so we heard from two funders, Volkswagen and uh, NIH. Uh, we're now turning to a perspective from the world of publishers, and where better to start than with the editor of Nature? 
Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Magdalena Skipper, Editor-in-Chief of Nature. And there's, there's a little voice in my head which says, forget this presentation and talk about the meaning of excellence. But I will be disciplined, and it's a uh, race against time. Yeah. Um, oh, and I just finished my talk. So I will, I will talk about, um, really, our experiments and trials. Yes? The thing is swapped around. Oh. I'm sorry. I have no notes, as you can see. That's better, thank you. It's going to have to stay like that. Okay, all right, that's fine. So I will talk about our experiments and trials and then what we have learned from them um, to implement on our journals. And I will really focus on three things, peer review, research integrity, and research culture. But I can also argue that all three of them could be under this umbrella of research culture. Actually, in my mind, they all fit together. So just a little bit of a historical overview um, about keys of experimentation that we've done at Nature and Nature Research Journals with regards to peer review. We all know that the system kind of works, it's imperfect, but we're all looking for something that may uh, be better than uh, the current system, and we haven't really quite found it. Well, you may not know that Nature started experimenting very early on. And so you see over on the right-hand side of the slide that we sort of experiment with open peer review already in 2006. And this was essentially an invitation to our authors to post their papers while we were considering them, to post them on a public pre-publication platform and have them reviewed by the community. And those comments will be taken into consideration by the editors when they came to make the decision. Um, I think we were a little bit ahead of the game, ahead of the time, uh, because this was uh, not very well received by the community and actually only after four months of that particular trial we stopped it. Um, what we much later introduced, in fact, as it says here, in March 2015, um, was an option on all of the nature-branded journals to have um, peer review done as double-blinded. And here, there was a really interesting lesson for us, a lesson which, if you're looking on the slide, you'll see in the numbers there, a lesson which told us why we should not introduce double-blind peer review as a blanket requirement on all our papers. You will see that the general uptake has remained very low, but what's really striking here is that the preference for double-blind peer review is really subject area specific. And that's something actually quite interesting that we see as we experiment with different forms of peer review, and, and I'll come back to this um, in a minute. Um, another thing, more recent uh, trial, this time on not within Nature Research portfolio, but more broadly in Spring and Edge on BMC journals, um, we have developed something called In Review, which is essentially um, uh, a platform, which is an author dashboard, but also for a pre-publication platform, which allows the authors not only to track the progress of their um, the article, the manuscript through peer review, but importantly for the for the purpose of this uh, discussion. It's open for comments from the community, again, for the authors and for the editors uh, to take into consideration. Another type of experiment which we started, in fact, on Nature Communications a few years ago, that was 2016, was what we call transparent peer review. So we refer to um, this form of review where we, the review happens in a traditional way. It can be either, either actually double-blinded or single-blinded, but at the end of the process, we say that if the author agrees, we will publish the referee reports, although anonymously. And again, this was another interesting uh, lesson for us. This was a trial on nature communications only, um, which again showed us that different disciplines within scientific research become ready at different times for that degree of openness. It's really striking. And I, and I, I bet you, I certainly could not predict which discipline was going to fall where. Um, I am probably not surprised that ecology and evolution is over all the way on the left, but I am a little surprised to see atomic particle and theoretical physics all the way to the right, considering that this was one of the first communities which embraced preprint. Um, so they're quite interesting lessons. And again, because of this variety in, in across disciplines, we have not made this um, a, a mandated uh, policy. So as I explained, it's the author who will agree with that their paper will be, when published, will be associated with published um, uh, reports. 
Now, another experiment that I will talk to you about in the realm of, of peer review is our peer recognition um, within nature research. This is something we started on nature um, itself a few years ago. And again, with consultation um, uh, with the authors of the paper, we would then approach the reviewers to say, would you like to be by name thanked by us as a journal um, when the paper is published. Um, and this was actually, we, we decided to um, even entertain this option following a, um, a, a survey of our reviewers and authors, and we got some interesting responses. Um, one thing I draw, one thing in particular I draw your attention to, which to me is actually very human, is if you look at the top on the left, 78% of respondents to this uh, survey said they felt naming reviewers res would result in better written reports, but only 52% would consider being named uh, <laughs> if given the option. It sounds familiar? I think so. So this is as much, so I, the only other thing I will say is that now um, uh, peer review recognition is actually being adopted by other journals within Nature Research Portfolio, and we're also considering transparent peer, peer, peer review, which I just showed you a couple of seconds ago, also across uh, the journals. So I'll say a few words about research integrity now. And I will start by saying this, that you know, many of us um, uh, think that uh, scientific, or have a rather preconception, what it is that scientific editors do. And we talk about it quite a lot. What we rarely talk about is the fact that they actually play an important function in publishing innovation and research integrity enhancement. And here I will share with you a couple of examples of exactly just that. So as a result of working with uh, different scientific communities, our editors have developed uh, these reporting checklists. We introduced them first um, on Nature itself in 2013, and we gradually iterated on these reporting checklists. They started with life sciences only, um, and subsequently were specifically developed to these fields that you can see over here, so MRI studies, flow, flow cytometry, uh, chip seek, and then uh, solar cells. And quite likely we will be developing others. And of course, each of, these, um, uh, each of these checklists continue to be iterated, as I said, as the community develops. Um, I am really gonna run out of time. Um, we do have an interesting independent evaluation, which I'm showing on the right. This was Malcolm McLeod's study published in 2016, which very nicely actually demonstrated that these reporting checklists were achieving something, and also very interestingly, the authors themselves who used those checklists at least once, so that they would use them again, even when designing new studies, not necessarily submitting papers to our journals. So this is what they look like. Um, of course, this is not just about reporting, che oh, reporting checklists, it's about um, uh, promoting open data. We have a number of ways of doing this, and in the interest of time, I will just mention this trial which was done on nature ecology involution just to demonstrate to you how simple it can be. So this was not mandating open data. This was the editors pushing the authors to say, if you're just going to say that data are available on request, you have to explain to, I, to us why that is the only way that you're going to make data available. And just doing that completely shifted the balance of how much data was available uh, in, a, some, in some kind of a repository. Um, the, I will skip over this, but Springer Nature has uh, research data support, uh, which supports researchers who themselves are perhaps not so savvy in how to manage the data in terms of preparing them for public access and, and sharing. And we must not forget this, that not everybody is as savvy as, as we are uh, in this audience. Um, sharing data, of course, is not the only thing that we're interested in. Uh, sharing code and materials is also another aspect. And I'll just mention uh, the panel which I'm showing at the bottom. Daniel Hook referred to um, uh, something similar right at the very beginning. Here I'm showing you another provider of software container tools. This is a, a trial which we've done ac across a number of nature research journals. Essentially, it's a container which allows our reviewers to review uh, code in the con context of data and the compiler and the environment, but then when the paper is published, it allows you as the reader to, to exactly do the same thing. 
So finally, very quickly, research culture. Um, I cannot not mention our um, efforts um, towards uh, promoting diversity, and we do it in a number of ways. But there, of course, never is enough. This, this, this job is, is never really done. Uh, but I, I had to mention it. One other thing, and this really pertains to um, uh, the evaluation of excellence. And, and this really rings true when you think about what uh, Jeremy Farrar wrote about the emphasis of what is the outcome of research as opposed to how it's done. Registered reports is a format in which we have become very interested. Um, Nature Human Behavior is the only journal within Nature Research Portfolio at the moment which offers that format, but there are a number of other journals within Spring and Nature that do. And this is exactly the kind of format which will surface excellence in the how and not the what at the end. So I'll just finish by saying that all of this, this experimenting, these trials, and subsequent implementation is, of course, uh, designed to take us towards this culture of transparency, collaboration, and sharing. And I will stop here. Thank you. Magdalena, thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, and from nature to e-life, Peter. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that eLife is funded by Welcome and Howard Hughes and Max Planck and the um, Wallenberg Foundation. So I'm going to talk a bit about peer review at eLife and a bit like Magdalena, some experiments we've done and some data when we've looked into our own processes and then tell you how we are in the process of acting on what we found. And if I have time, which I may not, I'll mention some meta research we've actually published, which I found interesting as well. So, um, oops, that's a bit far. eLife, um, we peer review roughly 30% of the submissions that we receive. The other 70% are returned to authors without um, peer review. Um, they're sent to referees, the referees report, and um, that's when the sort of what's different about the eLife peer review process kicks in. On a typical journal, um, when the last report comes in, the editor will read all the reports and make a decision and send it back to the authors, and it'll be up to them to interpret the decision, um, revise their manuscript accordingly, and resubmit. And the whole process might be repeated again. It'll be reviewed. It'll be sent back to the referees to be revised. We want to sort of try and cut through that process of lots of um, revision so what happens when the last report comes in, all the reviewers get to see all the other reports, including the identity of the referees. They have a discussion, and basically a couple of things can happen. If they think the results are interesting, the methods are robust, and we would like to publish the paper, we, the reviewers have a discussion and decide what revisions are needed to stand up the central conclusions in the paper. Um, and they will be sent to them in a decision letter. That letter won't include all the referee reports, so it'll mean there are criticisms of the paper made by the referees, which are not sent to the authors, because it's felt that those are sort of extra experiments are not necessary to make the paper stand up in its own right. If the paper is not so good, it'll just be rejected. Then the revision comes in, and the idea is that the reviewing editor, the person who's sort of handling this whole process, will read the response, and if he or she feels that the paper's been um, revised adequately, it'll just be accepted. And roughly three quarters of our papers are accepted at that without further review. And then when the paper's published, we publish the decision letter and the author response. And if the, um, so that's for every paper. And if the referees agree, we publish their names as well. And roughly a third of them agree to have their names published. Okay, and the aim basically is to try and, um, as I say, cut down on revision, but also to make the best use of everyone's time. Don't waste the author's time, don't waste the reviewer's time, don't waste the reader's time. Make the whole thing faster as well. So I'm going to talk about two studies we have done. First one was in, um, it's available in the bioarchive. It was done by a couple of our reviewing editors, a couple of eLife staff, and a couple of collaborators. We looked basically at something like 29,000 submissions, of which roughly 7,000 were reviewed. And the people doing, they had access to every, all the information that we had, and they just went and looked and interrogated our process as fully as they could. The main <coughs> outcomes, sadly, won't surprise you. Um, so the outcomes were more favorable to male authors. The overall accept rate was 
15.6% for men, last authors, 13.8% for women. That was a um, statistically significant difference. It was the same story for last authors and corresponding authors, but notably not for first authors. So that's slightly encouraging. Similar, we found that um, outcomes are more favorable for authors from North America and Europe. Um, no surprise there. Um, we also looked at the um, makeup of what were called gatekeepers, so that's editors and reviewers, and we found that those two groups, men and people from North America and Europe, were overrepresented compared to our authors. Sorry, compared to our authors, so that wasn't much of a surprise. Um, the one thing, when they, so I should say this is an absolutely enormous paper, 61 pages of it on um, bioarchive, currently going through review at PLOS Biology. Um, this phenomenon of homophily came out loud and clear, which this is the habit of um, basically gatekeepers to prefer manuscripts from authors who are like them. So male referees prefer papers from male authors, female referees prefer papers from female authors, <coughs> authors from country X prefer, referees from country X prefer papers from country X. So this is actually, um, sorry, I'm just constantly taking off and on my glasses. As you can see there, 50, um, if you take a case of an all-male reviewer team and a paper from male last authors, this was the accept rate after the initial triage stage. So it was, again, it was significantly higher for male last authors than female last authors. Um, and when there was a mixed gender review team, the whole situation was much fairer to everyone concerned. The um, geographic um, homophily, if the reviewer, if one of the reviewers and the last author were from the same country, the accept rate was much higher as well than if they weren't. So the second um, trial we did was different in the sense that we um, we wanted we give authors a chance to um, basically submit your paper if it if the senior editor is making a decision on whether we review it or not, agree to get it reviewed. We promise to publish it. It's up to you to respond to the referee reports as you see fit, but we will publish the revised paper, we will publish the decision letter and the reports, we'll publish your response, and we'll also publish an assessment from the editor as to how your revision addresses the concerns raised in the um, original reports. And those sort of assessments could be everything addressed, everything except a few minor issues addressed, or actually major issues remain. So we're still, um, we offered people we run this trial for about two months. Roughly 300 people opted in, 600 opted out. I should stress there was no randomization, there was no blinding, so that sort of limits the conclusions we can draw. We're still analyzing the data. We've published a few um, blog posts on it that you can find on our website. And if the first study I mentioned really showed you know, gender bias and geographic bias was at play, this um, show that um, career stage bias was at play as well. That wasn't something we looked at in the first study because we didn't have that data in our system. But, and we actually saw this um, career stage bias in the control sample, the 600, because we had to study that to see what effect um, the trial had on those papers. So what are we doing about this? Well, the, the obvious thing is to improve the diversity of our editorial boards. Um, our board of reviewing editors was about 430 of them. It's currently 68% male. We're doing our best to get it down to 60% by the end of this year with a, a goal of having it 50-50 um, in the long term. <coughs> We're also trying to improve the geographical diversity, trying to improve the career stage diversity. We're um, changing some of the language in emails that go to editors and reviewers, warning them about how bias is, is there, even if they, if they think it's not there or they're worried about it. We're collecting data on career stage with submissions so we can explore the, the career stage bias further. We're, gonna, we're thinking of exploring blinding in the very early stages of the process. So this is a bit anathema to eLife because we're, you know, we're, everything should be open. Mm -hmm. But we think you know, the, bi the bias is such that it, there might, it's worth looking at the, what, if there's any benefits to blinding. Um, we're going to get someone who's going to look at the um, natural language processing, apply it to the, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, the co consultation and just see, you might think a consultation, reviewers discussing the paper, that's, that's great, but it could be that that's a, a way for bias to get into the process 
even though it, it benefits it in lots of other ways. Um, we're, you, know, you might see from Mike Eisen's tweet, we're looking at publish, review, curate, i.e. everything's a preprint first, and we're also working with other people. So thanks very much. Peter, thank you. So we've had two funders, two publishers, and we're going to hear now from uh, Bev Holmes as our discussant. Another funder. Um, thank you to our Panorama and Snapshot speakers for, for very thought-provoking and I find inspiring presentations. Have you noticed how all the panels, everybody starts talking like this, and then as this goes to yellow, everybody speeds <laughs> up. It's actually very intimidating, this thing. Um, by way of an introduction, if you didn't hear me ask a question, and just so you know where my remarks are coming from, Bev Holmes, uh, I lead the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research in British Columbia, Canada. So it's uh, 8.30 in the morning and I haven't slept all night. Um, we're a government-funded organization and we're focused primarily on research talent development. And we do that through uh, eight funding competitions that are uh, launched annually. There is a foundation like ours in most of the provinces across the country. We work together and with our federal funders. So there's a, a couple of representatives here. So there's a few Canadians in the room. And we are all very excited about research on research, about joining this community, about learning from it, about contributing to it. Um, for our foundation, it's so important to us that it is one of four goals in our new strategic plan, which I think is quite brave from the reactions I'm getting. Um, but on that note, in my remarks, what I want to focus on is that strategic level. Um, so to make sure that we cover the bigger picture of the panel's charge, which is how is research on research informing strategy for funders and publishers. Perhaps our colleagues might have some more specific questions in the discussion to follow, but I'm going to kick things off with three very high-level high level observations for you as organizational leaders. Uh, Richard, I know you're retired, but you'll always be an organizational leader in my mind. Um, and aspects of these have come up in various ways throughout the, for, throughout the day, including in these presentations, and they are accountability, broader research system, and diversity in research on research. So I'll start with accountability, and there's both an internal and external piece. Internally, uh, how do you and how do we ensure accountability in our research on research work, even, at, even as it is aimed <laughs> at making us more accountability, more accountable rather, as, as funders? Um, so at the strategy level, how do we decide how much attention to pay for, to it? What resources to expend on it? How do we not get lost in pursuing answers to really interesting but maybe not ultimately useful questions? And when I say not ultimately useful, I'm not suggesting that everything should be instrumental. I mean, I think useful would be actually finding out how important it is to, to, to support discovery research or the uh, eccentrics, as VJ put it this morning. And just where I'm coming from on that note is that when we told our government, um, and they pay a lot of attention to, to what we're doing, when we told them about our research on research goal, I think it was part confusion and part panic. I mean, they're just getting used to the idea that they actually have to fund research, never mind research on research. And that relates to external perceptions. So how do, how do you, how do we create awareness of the importance of this field without being promotional? And we've heard about that today, too. Um, it may be less relevant to those of you who are not evaluated and funding, funded annually by government. But of course, we should all be thinking about it. Um, uh, Richard, I don't, I don't know if this slide made it in, but at one point, you referred to boasting about our progress. And unfortunately, that is a trap that a lot of funders fall into. We do evaluations so that we can tell stories about how great we are, so that we can get more money to do our great work. And of course, we make researchers play that game, too. But research on research is such a fabulous learning opportunity, as all of you have demonstrated. How do we collectively promote the work so it's not only accepted, but that it's expected? Second question area, how do those of us doing or supporting research on research connect to a broader research system? And so the way I think of our work as a funder is that there's stuff we can do, and there's stuff that we can't do, but we have to try to influence it. Otherwise, the stuff that we do will never be as good as it can. So Peter, you talked about the diversity of editorial boards and your goal to get them to 50-50. Fantastic, if, if the women are out there to take on those roles. Um, Richard, you talk about your dislike of bibliometrics. 
Others love them. So, you know, how do we deal with that? Wilhelm, the lack of time and space for creativity and fundamentally new ideas. You're doing some amazing things, but we still work in a system that doesn't necessarily um, think the same. Uh, Magdalena, review, recognizing reviews uh, across your journal, so working within your system. So all the research on research work that you're doing is relevant to your organizations, but also much more broadly relevant, and ultimately your success relies on a bigger system. So I'm, I think the Research on Research Institute is a great opportunity to make that happen, but there may be other connections. Does change happen organically, or, or do, we, do we need to to shove it a little bit. And the third and final area, I'm still green, um, a related question came up early in the day. What is the diversity we need in the research on research field itself? Oh, there it goes. How, and how does that happen? So many of us are working on EDI, and we've heard about that in, in the last panel. Public and patient engagement may be a subset of that, although we haven't heard a lot about that. It's big in Canada, public and patient engagement in research. Um, and so is our strong commitment to our Indigenous colleagues to think about research in completely new ways. So I'm excited about what I've heard today about EDI in peer review and in funding allocation. Do we also need to think about EDI in research on research work? Because I hear a lot about we, and I'm just wondering who is the we that is actually helping to set this agenda? Um, Two-letter word with big implications, and I, I'm really looking forward to discussing how to ensure the right questions get asked, how the right data get collected from the right sources so that we don't just, as Richard, you said in one of your slides, reify a current power structure. Thank you. And I'm still ye yellow. Woo! <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic, um, succinct, and insightful uh, summary. Um, we have uh, 15 minutes for some questions and discussion. Probably not a lot to answer all of the questions that uh, Bev has just uh, set us. But uh, as before, if people want to come down and use the mic here, or we do have roving options as well. But let's take a few uh, and get the conversation going uh, in the time we have. So if anyone else wants to, sorry. Yeah, stop. Hi, Theo Bloom from the BMJ, and I'll just, I want to make a couple of plugs and an endorsement of your final point, I think. Uh, plug number one, the BMJ has been doing trials on peer review and publication bias for something like 20 years, and we do them as randomized controlled trials in the same, with the same rigor and the same expectations of the as we have of the research we publish. And I want to push my publishing colleagues to do the same and not to call something an experiment when it was a one-armed trial with no control, uh, but to really do proper experiments. And then plug number two is to then take them to the Peer Review Congress, which happens every four years. The next one is in 2021. And I know Richard was at the last one and, and Nature colleagues and so on to really try and say we've analysed this stuff properly and we've found conclusions that we can rely on because it's about time we understood the impact of what we were doing. Thanks. Great, good point. We'd certainly clock the next peer review congress as well. Uh, yes. Uh, Thomas Enke from the Lundbeck Foundation in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, thank you for an excellent uh, session, an excellent day, and this initiative is fantastic. Um, I've on all the literature I have read about uh, identifying the right uh, grant to support, I think there is all the evidence suggests that the last funded project is as good as the best funded project when you do the scorings. So we are not reactive, we are actually not very good at deciding whom to get funded, and I think this is also what was hinted to. And I think this is one of the reasons for what you are doing at the, uh, and we are doing in Denmark to try to do some other ways to go. But why don't we move faster with this? I, I simply, I mean, we have for many years acknowledged that we cannot identify the best as we do it today. But we still keep spending a lot of effort and money on bringing people together and trying to grade and, uh, and, and order the, the, the application we have. So I just want the funders here, the two funders here, to reflect on what else can we do to get more diversity, that I think was one of your main messages. And then just to, the, uh, to nature, I've just, this is more out of curiosity. Uh, you showed that um, there was some reluctancy to go into the open review process of papers. It was also field dependent. Do you know anything about age dependency in, in, in that? It will be interesting to know as well. Thank you. Thank you. So one each publishes funders, an extra one for Nature, 
Uh, one more question, and then we'll uh, come back to the panel. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, Deborah Kahn from Taylor and Francis. Um, I think this is a great initiative, really, really excited by it. I'd just like to um, make a plea for EDI, including other um, disciplines apart from science. I mean, this panel is completely STEM. There's been the, the um, people who are behind Rory are mainly from biomedical or science backgrounds. And so including humanities, arts, social sciences is going to be really important and I'd just like to make the plea for that. As someone who works in a politics department, I fully agree. Uh, okay, uh, we'll take one last one, we'll come back to the panel. Right, um, I think this comes back to some of the comments earlier this morning about transparency. I think almost all of the studies that were presented are using administrative data, which is great, but it's all data inside the organization that's doing the study. Um, and having been someone who was actually on that NIH paper on bias, um, no one else could do that work. Only contractors have access to the data with specific privileges. So I just kind of want to put a call out there to the funders and to the publishers to the extent that you can, and I know it's not possible to release everything. I get it. I completely get it. You know, is there a way that more of the information about funding, right, about peer review can be made available more generally to initiatives like Rory so that external bodies can also participate in some of these studies, right, using some of the data. And I think this is where things like grant DOIs, right, uh, ORCID identifiers, some other kinds of things might be really useful. So I'm, I'm looking, I'm interested in comments from the folks on the, on the table here about how some of these data could be made more available. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let's start with the publishers. Magdalena, do you want to kick off and then... Uh. Okay, so um, there was the first question was for me specifically about um, how the willingness to participate in open peer review uh, tracks with age as a, as a variable. Um, so we actually don't have sufficient data to answer the question in a robust way, but anecdotal data, some more qualitative data, suggests that a number of um, earlier career researchers um, are concerned about the potential implications associated with open peer review, um, if they are the reviewers. And you know, the, the, the issue that is brought up is very easy to imagine, and that's very simply, if the person you have just been, uh, whose work you've just been critical of is then going to review your next grant, then if you are an early career researcher, that may be problematic. I have also seen qualitative, um, specifically on social media, actually comments from um, women who are reviewers in the open um, uh, peer review setting who feel um, less able to express themselves if they have to be named. But, but this is not robust. This is sort of um, qualitative uh, comments. And since I have the talking stick, if I, if I may continue to the second point about um, opening up the data. So um, this is actually a very important point, and it's a point that we have thought about previously. In fact, over lunch today, I was talking to James Evans about this as well, and of course, I've spoken about, it, about this to, to others. Um, we haven't done it for a number of reasons, which are actually um, a mixture of um, legal reasons, but also our own um, uh, sort of pragmatic reasons for how, how we store the data or how we could sort of mobilize them. But um, this is, I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that we increasingly push our authors to be transparent about our data. And if we really want to put our money where our mouth is, then we should be transparent about our own data. Oh, somebody's applauding. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, you asked the question. <laughs> so um, I can't say that we're going to do it tomorrow because we, we're simply not set up to do it, but it's certainly something that we, we continue to think about, and that's a very important point. Peter, anything you want to add? Quickly? Yeah, I should say um, when I speak in response to from the BMJ, when I normally speak about um, innovations in publishing, I credit the BMJ and PLOS and EMBO as three bodies that have been doing this long before eLife was ever around. Um, although I'm not sure we need um, an RCT for every experiment in publishing. We, there's some things you just have to measure, investigate to make a start and sort of a, like an RCT is a sort of a gold standard for doing something like this, which is sort of, I think would be too much to, to begin with. 
Wilhelm, if you want to pick up the point from Taylor and Francis on yeah, disciplinary divest. The standby is I force, should have explained that the Volkswagen Foundation funds about 40% in the humanities and social sciences, and large parts of our programs are dedicated to this. Uh, but of course, uh, many, many problems we are confronted with are to be shared across the various disciplines. Although, of course, with respect to the question, shouldn't we move faster with uh, randomization, etc., Thomas, um, you, we also have to pay attention to our own reputation. So if we were to throw the lot uh, immediately without this kind of quality control before, that would also be dangerous because then we may also end up with, let's say, funding things which are not really living up to any scientific quality expectation. So it's a, it's a delicate balance between, on the one hand, trying to make sure that you have a certain set of things to choose from, and on the other hand, of course, randomly open it up to everybody. So it will take time still to actually select the uh, things, but then due to this experiment we are currently doing, we hope to learn also with respect to, well, the issue came up several times, biases. Um, you see, we're still struggling with the, fa the effect which was also shown from eLife and others that you have a certain imbalance in the final selection between men and women and between race and whatever. But um, at the end of the day, we hope to find out to what extent does also, and that's my hunch, linguistic ability to do the self-appraisal in your proposal to such an extent as men usually like to do, how to what extent does that play a role in differentiating between the various proposals despite the fact that you've taken away the CV and the publication list? Richard and Bev, any final yeah, questions? Um, I'd like to comment on the reliability of peer review. One of the interesting outcomes of that study, which is a secondary finding, by the way, the primary um, analyses were all pre-registered so, um, so that we could not manipulate them for our own purposes. Um, but what we found was that uh, peer review is pretty good, can reliably pick off the top third, that is there is a reliable agreement uh, to pick off the top third of applications, which is why internally I was pushing hard to uh, for each of the institutes to develop a 30% success rate. That is, in fact, a manipulable um, outcome. And some of the institutes have, in fact, gone to that figure. Um, other institutes remain at around 10%. So um, we agree that if you have a 10% success rate, the results are random. Um, and finally, all the studies that I've been associated with were publishing the background data, except that they have to be de-identified. <coughs> and uh, with that control, we are trying to get this information out because we believe it's useful for the community. Thank you. Beth. Yeah, just quickly, I think it was Thomas that talked about um, why aren't we, why aren't funders acting on some of these, some of these findings? And partly. Well, I think they are. They're starting to. I think I think the Research and Research Institute uh, will legitimize some of this. And I think I think funders are getting braver as they as they as the whole area gets legitimized. Um, and it's partly my my remarks on um, when do we know when to stop looking at these fascinating things and actually apply them, and then how do we connect to part of the system? Because some of this stuff is 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 pretty unsettling. W one of the things that we've noticed and we need to act on we 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 uh, review we have review panels in biomedical or basic research, um, clinical research, health policy research, and population and public health. And over the last couple of years, as money gets tighter, the biomedical researchers are all of a sudden rating all their people very, very highly. The population health researchers, they just about eat their own. They get harder, and they, they rank harder and harder. So there's something very, very wrong with the way that we're actually rating these applications. And it's, it, I think it's just time to do something about these things. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Great. We have time for maybe two or three there's another, quick questions. I think there's one, one here, one there, one there and one, one, there, one there. Yeah. Great. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I'm Flaminio uh, Squazzoni from the University of Milan in Italy, and uh, I just would like to expand a little bit on one of the previous questions about um, the access to data, in the sense that it seems to me that there's a very dramatic gap between uh, those yeah. agencies or journals of publishing who have data about internal process of peer review and those who idly are interested to 
make research on, on peer review. So what do you think is possible? So it seems to me there's an infrastructure gap. So um, we'd like to have your opinion about what can be done in, to make it the sharing of peer review data from journals or from funding agencies a little bit more regular for independent research and scrutiny. Great, thank you. And the second one here, yes. Um, people who are pro uh, proposing more transparency and open uh, openness in peer review and other things is that you'll be able to start to track all of this bias and expose individuals or groups or whatever that are, are doing this. And yet we also know at the same time that uh, revealing reviewer identities um, exposes the reviewer and that openness can actually limit honest conversation in our current culture. So how can you address this paradox and make it safe, especially for early career researchers, to do, uh, to openly, to, to, re to reveal their names in review, which I think is, will lead to all of, not solving the problems, but at least to making us much more aware of the extent of the problems there are. <laughs> Thank you. And finally. Um, it relates to, um, sorry, I'm not right on, um, Gail Vallée Tourangeau from Kingston University. Um, it relates to this access to open uh, data. Mine is more of a comment. Um, we work in collaboration with the Welcome, and I think we have a solution or a proto-solution because we work on peer review of grant proposal. But um, there is a, a trust that we can establish with researcher if we work together. And so we've established NDAs so that we've, we've bind by that contract that we would not reveal anything about who we talk to. Um, but we can still make things publicly available and we can still access data. And other examples are things like uh, the data brary for uh, people who do research that involves video data where anonymity is an issue. They uh, have set up a uh, repository where the data is only accessible to vetted researchers. So researchers who pass a certain cap. So I think Rory for me is, is an opportunity to think about how to make the data semi-open for researchers, not necessarily to the public, but researchers have been better. Thank you, thank you. Great. Well, we have three minutes left, so 30 seconds from each of you, picking one of those and giving your quick thoughts. We'll start this time with Bev. I am actually going to give my, my, my 30 seconds oh. away. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Spirit of reciprocity. <laughs> Okay, about the question about reviewer identities. I think give, in an ideal world, the reviews and the identities of the reviewer would be made public, public. but if we can only have one, I think it's better to have the review itself. Um, there are mechanisms like publins where people can somehow get credit um, for reviews without revealing their identity. Um, I, I think it's a real shame that people are reluctant to name themselves, especially as the it would be in the context of papers that have been published, which you assume they, they, they had been positive about. You know, the, the real worry would be for the papers that are rejected. And that, that as far as I'm aware, there are no plans to reveal the names of reviewers who ha have been involved in the rejection of papers. Great, Richard. I think that the way we, I think that the way we do things uh, in peer review, where reviewers have to expose themselves to other reviewers, really helps control their behavior without exposing their names directly to the uh, applicants. So I'm going to um, uh, draw your attention, and actually it's almost a recommendation for, for Rory. So the, to me, there's something interesting in the, um, in the fact that different disciplines behave in a different way. So we know, you, know, you, you mentioned mm. you from a political sciences department, right? In your field, it's all open or all closed? Which way, which way around is it? In political sciences? Well, the review. Closed, review. Closed, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so, it's, so there are disciplines which have adopted one way or another, and even in the, on the slides that I showed, you know, why is it that geologists and environmental and ecological biologists are very happy to have open peer review, transparent peer review, and, and in my experience, a larger proportion of those researchers automatically sign the reviews, regardless of whether these reviews are going to be published or not. And some other disciplines are not willing to do that. Is there something interesting to explore in how these communities are organized? Can we learn something from these groups that naturally tend towards their openness? I think that would be an interesting thing to explore. Mm, that's good. 
finally, Bill. I think there are huge differences among and between disciplines and on how they actually appreciate peer review processes and how they go about it. Uh, for instance, in the social sciences, that's my experience, not only in Germany, but in also in other countries, you see hardly anyone acknowledges his colleagues as the most excellent person. Uh, in engineering and in physics, it's a totally different setup. Usually people are very positive about their colleagues, um, and that already uh, really impacts on the decision making in institutions because you usually end up with at least one critical review of a social science project and you have clear cut decisions or recommendations on life science and, and natural sciences kind of things. So that's one thing. The other thing is that we experience that people are very proud to put in their CV that they are members of our review panel X, Y or Z or that they have been reviewing things for us for quite some time, but very reluctant that we actually openly communicate to the applicant who they were. So that's a huge discrepancy, I think, which we'll have to deal with in due course. Excellent. We've brought the session in on time. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, we are now within sight of the end. It's been a long day, lots of rich content, but I'm sure I'm not the only one uh, at this stage who could do with a drink. Um, <laughs> We're going to hand now seamlessly without a break over to our next panel, but as we do that, uh, please join me in clapping out uh, our excellent speakers, Bev Holmes, Peter Rogers, Richard Nakamura, Magdalena Skipper and Dylan Kroll. Thank you.